Ah, alô? 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 Pessoal, aqui na bancada de software livre, nós vamos começar com uma palestra da Denise Cooper sobre a OSI, que é a Open Source Initiative. Há uma, uma sociedade open source. Eu vou tentar traduzir a palestra para vocês. A Denise anunciou ontem que ela é a nova CTO da Wikipedia. Então, é uma oportunidade incrível a gente estar com uma pessoa como ela aqui. Então, aproveitem bem a palestra, vai ser muito legal. Deixa eu só fazer uma pergunta. Quem não fala inglês aqui? Todos falam inglês? Todos entendem? Vocês preferem com tradução ou sem tradução? Não precisa de tradução? Sim? Quem quer tradução, levanta a mão. Tradução? Oi? O som é, é uma dica... Se ouve melhor no fundo do que na frente, tá? Porque os alto-falantes são lá. Vocês querem tradução? Ok. They won't translate, so I'll try. Hello. Oi. A sugestão dele é que quem quiser tradução, sente aqui e eu posso fazer a tradução uh, só para as pessoas que querem tradução para a palestra ficar melhor. Tudo bem para vocês? Aqui, então? So while everybody's changing chairs, thank you for doing it this way. No, I just need one. We might need one for the audience. <sighs> so hello. How many of you guys have been here uh, all week? Are you getting tired yet? <laughs> the guy in the back is like, yeah. <laughs> it's just insane. This, this conference is insane. You guys, I, it's really exciting, but it's also an awful lot, you know? And the sound thing is very strange. Okay, so today's topic is the, is the open source initiative. And, and I want to thank Fabian for uh, introducing me. I heard the word Wikipedia go by. So you guys must have just heard about that. Um, I am very happy to talk to anybody who's interested in Wikipedia here in Brazil. But you have to understand, I don't actually start working for them until Monday. So I'm not incredibly informed yet. I mean, I, I was informed enough to get hired, but I don't really know deeply and widely what's going on yet. But I'm interested in learning. So if anybody wants to talk to me about that afterwards, I'm very happy to talk. Wow, I got bigger. Oh, now I can fight against them. This is great. All right. So this is going to be about the OSI. How many of you know what the OSI is? OK. This may be a boring presentation to you. I'll try to include stuff to make it not so boring. I, I created this presentation for some people in America who still didn't know the, the material in this presentation. And I gave this presentation four months ago. So this will tell you how many people there are in the US that don't quite get it yet, OK? This room was packed. And it was me and Larry Rosen giving this talk. All right, so open source, you guys all know what free software is, right? So I believe that free software and open source are basically the same thing. Free software people often want to talk about a political agenda that open source people prefer not to talk about because we basically we created open source to make business people be more comfortable with the concepts of free software. Because business people get real nervous when they see people in, in GNU suits. You know, it makes them nervous. And so most of us are free software members, free software foundation members, and we you know believe strongly in 
everything that the Free Software Foundation believes in, but we think that the political conversation about freedom is better left to enthusiasts and new people coming into open source probably can't handle that. Many of them can't. They grow into it over time, typically. My friend Simon, who was in the audience a minute ago, he started out <coughs> afraid of the Free Software Foundation and now he's their good friend. It just takes a while. So, the big difference between this and what the four freedoms say is that we go ahead and call out, it must be forkable. It must be freely usable and non-discriminatory. And the, free the, the freedoms also say that, but it's kind of buried. So we brought it out because those two issues are very, very important to business. They need to understand the concept of forkability. Okay, so the open source initiative we maintain the trademarks on the term open source license, okay? We, we filed for those trademarks in the US. We, they've been awarded to us. We own those trademarks. And whenever somebody claims to be open source for marketing purposes, but we go look at their license and it's not open source, we send them a little note and say, you really need to talk to us. And so far, everyone that has done that, we've been able eventually to talk to them. Uh, and, and convince them to change their strategy. Most countries in the world point at the open source definition, which we maintain as the definition of what open source means. And we also do a lot of talking. We do a lot of negotiating with companies and with governments. And we travel the world, basically, to support this idea. These are the open source trademarks. And as I say, they're registered with the U.S. Trade Patent Office and um, Patent and Trademark Office, sorry. And we have guidelines on our website about how to use these the right way. And there's a picture I really like using. You might have seen it on, in the first presentation I did this week of a Brazilian flag that's an eyeball and it's got the OSI logo next to it. That's a perfectly legitimate use. Okay, so this talk is really about why there are so many licenses. Because it's really co it's common for people who are fond of free software to claim that open source is a problem because there are so many licenses. So this is about explaining that problem, and why it exists, and some advice about how to get around it. Okay? So part of the reason there are too many licenses is because they're not all easy to read. One of the licenses that is not easy to read is in fact GPL v2. It's, and LGPL is even worse. It's very hard to read those licenses if you're a lawyer and make sense of them. And so it's a natural thing for these lawyers getting involved in free software and open source to want to rewrite the license. And that a lot of them have done that. And, and in the early days of open source, we wanted business to feel comfortable. So we started talking to them and they all wanted their own license with their name on it. And, and we decided that as a strategic move, having them get those licenses, use them, realize that they don't really help them build community and eventually abandon them was probably the right way to go. Because they were gonna use them anyway, whether we told them they could or not. It seemed like the right way to go. And it turned out to work. So Sun, when I worked at Sun, they made me write three different licenses. But over time, they abandoned all three and went in, in favor of LGPL and Apache. That's the right outcome. Literally every conversation I have had with a corporation around the world and most, most government conversations, when I say, don't write your own license, use an existing license, they all, it goes in one ear and out the other, and they write their own license anyway. So it seems to be a necessary part of the learning cycle. I think if the GPL v3 uh, drafting had been a little more successful, it might have cut down on this. But GPL v3 is not, it, it's better from a legal perspective, but it's still very difficult for lawyers to feel comfortable with because there's no precedent law. And so there's still, tempted to write another license, okay?
<laughs> so these days, we don't, we don't approve very many licenses. These days, when somebody sends us a license with the vanity, with just the name on it that's different, we tell them no. We say, sorry, we don't, we, there are enough licenses now. You need to learn how to use one of the existing licenses. Or tell us why yours is different other than your name is different. And that's working pretty well. But when you're choosing a license, you have to do these things. You have to, you have to read them all, decide which one you like. And there are 56 of them, I think. Decide which one you like. And then you have to figure out what you're trying to achieve. Now, if what you're trying to achieve is make the world of free software bigger, then your choice is easy. But what if you're doing a web application and you're worried because the GPL only triggers on distribution, right? The reason Google doesn't have to give back changes is because they're not actually giving away any code. This is why they don't give away code. They're performing their code on the web, and that is not distribution. So they don't have to give back their free software changes. There are some licenses that require different behavior that are still open source licenses. And so you might choose one of those if you're trying to get that effect. There are licenses that require attribution. And if that's the most important thing to you, you might choose one of those. The Apache family of licenses has no restriction on use of the code. You, it basically says, go ahead and use the code, just don't claim you wrote it. And you might choose to use that license if code reuse was your most important goal. So not, code, not the freedom thing, but the reuse thing. Here's a spectrum of licenses. I have to walk for this one. Over here on the left, copy left, is the GPL. Also, the open source license is over here. That's because they're both inherited licenses. Uh, some, some people like to say viral licenses. That means if your code touches their code, your code has to also be licensed this way. Okay? It's the most extreme in one sense. It's the most freeing in another sense. So that's on that side, OK? Everybody clear on that? Yeah? OK, over here on the right is proprietary licensing. This is like the anti-free software, old-fashioned Microsoft licensing. They're, they're, they're using copyright laws. It's handy that they're also on the right of the continuum. And this is not, you cannot go play with this software safely unless you enter into a license with this entity. This is hidden code, OK? Now, here in the center are what we call the copy center licenses. You know, like when you go and put, you make a copy of a piece, you know, put it in the machine, push the button, and a copy comes out. We call them copy center because they're in the center of the, of the continuum. And they basically say, make as many copies as you want. We don't care. Just don't claim you wrote that. And that includes the BSD and the Apache license. I'm sorry, that should say S. That's a typo. I can change that. I'm not sure how long that's been there. <laughs> All right, then between, between copy center and copy left is a bunch of licenses that were written by corporations. And they usually say things like, the Mozilla license says, this code is open, and there's a fence around it. And if you want to talk through the APIs that we've provided, then your code can be under any license it wants to be. So there's no viral aspect. But if you change our code, you will owe those changes back. So it's kind of like I'm giving you a gift, but I'm not telling you how to use it. Does that make sense? So that's your crash course in, in the world of open source licensing. So to review, copy left. That's the stuff out there with Richard Stallman. It's very clever. Inheritance is the term they like to use instead of viral, because viral sounds like germs, like it makes you sick. Viral is a term that Microsoft started using to make people afraid. But we prefer to say inherited. Okay? 
They're owned by the Free Software Foundation, most of them. In the GPL, there's a lot of political information. So it's not just a license, it's also a political manifesto. And that's very attractive to some people. In Brazil here, I think the GPL is the most popular license. And, and that's because free software is connected to politics in this country. And there's lots of famous software under this license. There's lots. Although the proportion has been going down in the last few years. It used to be like 94%. And I think it's down in the 70s now. About 70% of the code that is called open source and free software is under this one of these licenses. Copy Center, those are the do what you want licenses. That's like the Apache license, the MIT license, the BSD license. They started out being universal, university authored, and they're very easy to read, like six clauses. Very easy. And then there are the hybrid licenses that live in between. And they tend to be written by corporations. They're really clearly legal. They're well written from a legal perspective. And they tend to create little, little kiddie pools of community. They don't create a big ocean of code that you can reuse together. They create little tiny pools of code. The most famous project under this type of license is Mozilla. But Mozilla is actually licensed also under LGPL. So it's hard to say where they fall today. But their original license was, was this license. And they wrote the very first one. So other things you need to think about when you're choosing a license. What about other code that's going to live with this code? Do you have any ties to proprietary software that you have to think about? Um, what is the community like? Part of how I convinced Sun that OpenOffice needed to be under an LGPL family, uh, uh, an LGPL license, was because we wanted to attract the GNOME community. And they had already chosen free software. They'd already chosen GPL, so Sun had no choice. It was a good, it was a good lever to get them to do that. And then you need to realize that copyright is only one thing. There's also trademark law, and there is um, patent law to think about when you think about designing an open source project and all the issues that might fall out from that. The most important thing to remember is you want to create unintended consequences. You want people to use your code in ways that you didn't think of. That's the open source effect. Just getting people to share work on your project is only half of it. You want people to use that code to do new things. Ultimate code reuse is the whole reason we do this. Let's see. So you might, you might find it useful to know a lawyer. The first time I came to Brazil for FISLE, I spent about half my time talking to lawyers because Brazilian lawyers were just starting to understand. This was a long time ago, 2003 or 4. They were just starting to understand licensing. You guys were working on a national license because everybody needs their own license, right? And we were trying to talk you out of doing that because <laughs> it's not a good idea. But I think you did. And in the end, there was a national license, but it was never submitted to the OSI. So it's not really an open source license because we haven't agreed that it is, right? Um, the biggest thing to learn from this is use an existing license. Find the community you want to be part of and match their licensing strategy. Because that's your best way to get there. And if you find a project that you're interested in that's claiming to be open source, but you can see that they discriminate, like they say, uh, free except for commercial use, that's not open source. So you can call us or send us an email and, and to, uh, at, it tells you how at opensource.org. And we will send them a letter. And we will tell them that they're misusing our trademark. Also, if you see that green keyhole trademark copied anywhere that's not open, like Microsoft used it not too long ago, we called them up and said, you have to stop that. That's our trademark. We're required to do that by US trademark law. And how we find instances of that is the larger community letting us know. Because there's only 10 of us 
it's really hard for us to keep track of everything. As busy as I am in open source, I still don't know everything. And so we really need all of you to help us. And now my favorite part, I will answer any question you have <laughs> until we run out of time. If you don't have questions, then we'll all go drink beer, OK? Does anybody have a question? If we can get them to translate the questions for you. You don't have to do it in English. Bruno, you're going you're gonna to deal with questions? Ah, there's one. He has a question. O que, que acontece com uma empresa quando ela não segue corretamente a, a licença? Well, first we write to them, and we we usually get into a conversation with them. Part of the reason that we have an international membership on our is so that if it's here in South America, we can make Bruno go do it, right? So that it isn't an, a language barrier problem. But first we have a conversation. We explain to them why they don't want to do it. Eventually, if they refuse and they refuse, then we'll end up having to create a public opinion campaign, which has been very successful for us. There is not a single company that we haven't tried to educate that hasn't gotten very afraid and changed their practices immediately. Either they will stop saying they're open source or they'll figure out how to be open source. Those are the only two options. Right? And it has worked really well, even with really big companies like Microsoft. We watch them pretty closely because right now they're just starting out trying to understand open source. They don't really want it to exist still. And so they're highly motivated to screw it up. And so we watch them a lot. And, but there's lots of little companies out there that they're not trying to be bad. They just don't know. And so we help them by explaining it. Okay? Does that help? Does that answer your question? Good. Somebody else? Either of you guys, it doesn't matter. We'll get to everybody. <laughs> Você poderia falar um pouco sobre o problema do Z File System ser incorporado no Linux? Z File System. Z. E você acha que isso pode mudar com a situação da Oracle agora? Okay, here's a fun one. So the last license that I wrote, and by the way, I'm not a lawyer, right? <laughs> But the last license I wrote while I was at Sun is called CDDL, Cuddle. And it is a rewrite of Mozilla because they liked Mozilla, even with everything they knew. For, for Solaris, they were very concerned that, and when I say they, it was the engineers that wrote Solaris who were concerned. This is an interesting thing. Most companies would just, the management would just say, you have to do it this way. But at Sun, which is no more, and let's pause for a minute and be sad about that, engineers were very important. They were the, they were the artists. And if they felt strongly about something, they could influence the company direction. So part of why it took so long to get Solaris opened was because the engineers were not so sure it was the right idea. And eventually they got convinced because um, China would not buy anything that wasn't open source. That's really what convinced them. So then they wanted to do a license. They did not want a license that was compatible with GPL because they didn't want all of their hard work to just migrate into Linux because they wrote this thing and they You know, you know why, right? It's why you don't want your, your daughter to date the wrong guy. It's the same exact thing. So they, can, they required me to write this license. It was very depressing. I actually left Sun right after this license came out because it was so depressing that they hadn't learned. I wanted it to go out under BSD because that's where it came from. That code originally was BSD code. It was AT&T that made them change the licensing. And I really wanted it to go back to BSD. But we weren't able to convince them. So that is why ZFS and Cuddle are not compatible. 
Cuddle is compatible with every other kind of licensing except free software licensing, and that's intentional on Sun's part. Now, it's possible that Oracle will rethink that. I don't know if you paid attention to their announcements this week, but I paid very close attention, and they did not mention Open Solaris. So it might mean that they're willing to change that licensing because they don't value it so much. We, we don't know. What's happening right now, while we're all having fun here, people in America are finding out that they don't have jobs because Oracle is cutting them off, right? And so when all of that's done, and it's going to take a while, it'll be another couple of weeks because there's people in Europe, there's people in, you know, they have to, it has to go through the whole world. But we will learn a lot about their real intentions by how they perform those layoffs. We're already learning some of it, and, and this is going to be a political moment for me, but I listened to them talk about a project called Glassfish, right, which is the reference implementation for Java EE. They said they, were in, they cared about Glassfish, but they proceeded to lay off the entire engineering team today. So I'm having a hard time believing them right now, if you don't mind. <laughs> we'll see what happens with Solaris, but that's why. The people that invented ZFS simply did not want to see it migrate to Linux because that's not, that wasn't their plan for it. Somebody okay. else? You already? I'm sorry? You already answered. Oh, I already answered it? Oh, come on. Find another one. There's some back there. There's some back there. Tem camiseta para quem fizer pergunta, tá? I know. I'm never wrong about that stuff. I always know. Oi. <laughs> Eu queria saber na avaliação da Denise quão, quão open source é, pretende ser o protocolo, o novo protocolo do Google, Google Wave. You know, I haven't actually looked very closely at Google Wave. In Silicon Valley, people don't get it yet. Um, there, I'm, I'm on the board of something called the Open Web Foundation, and a lot of the people on the Open Web Foundation board work for Google. They had their board meeting today, and they took their notes in Wave. <laughs> and we're all kind of going, what do we do with this? You know, I mean, it's an interesting problem. Nobody, nobody outside of the people in Google that know how to use it have much of a clue about what it's supposed to do. And um, I have not paid much attention to its licensing. I logged in, I had a look, I went, okay, <laughs> and I walked away, right? Um, the, the more interesting technology for me right now from Google is Android, because it's so disruptive and it's so interestingly constructed. <clears throat> and for those of you that don't know, the big risk that they took was everybody that was doing a mobile platform wanted embedded Java, everybody wanted it. And Sun was not licensing it very nicely. And they, they really wanted to make money off of it. So even at Apache, when Apache Harmony was, was created, and you know I helped create the Harmony project to force Sun to open source Java, because it was my, my cause for six years, right? Um, that project has, e, has uh, J2ME inside of it, because that's, ME is part of, of the language, right? And Sun won't let them prove that it's Java, even though they've been very fa faithful to the specifications, because they want to put a field of use restriction on, e on ME licensing. And now, I don't know whether Oracle will change that strategy or not. Before Oracle owned ME, they were very bullish on that strategy changing. <laughs> In the JCP, they were really arguing for that change. It'll be interesting to see how they feel about it now. but. This is a problem for all mobile platforms. Either they pay a lot of money to get Java, or they have no Java. The iPhone has no Java. St Steve Jobs just decided it's not going to happen. I know it works on the iPhone because James Gosling made it work. <laughs> I went to a, to a Mac world one time where Gosling was in the audience, and I walked up to him and I said, are you doing an announcement? And he said, no, I was supposed to do an announcement. I'm here, I'm rehearsed. But Steve just decided we're not doing it. So there you go. I, it's, I, I don't know all the story. I just know that much of it. But for Android, they wanted to fix this problem. But they couldn't 
a reach a deal with Sun that they could live with. So they went to Harmony and they pulled the class libraries. And then they created their own VM. And so what they did, Harmony is an Apache project. They put those class libraries together with a new VM and created something that's Java compatible, but it's not Java. Like, how smart is that, right? Now, they may be drawing a lawsuit, and maybe now that that's owned by Oracle, that's a scary proposition, but we'll see, you know? <laughs> Open source is about unintended consequences, and I'm here to tell you, Sun did not love that move. <laughs> Interestingly enough, Intel wanted to use Harmony for Moblin, but then they did a deal with Sun for chip sales, and all of a sudden they were afraid to do it. So it's really funny how this stuff happens. Somebody should write a book someday about all the background stuff. Yeah, I don't know if it's me, but somebody should. Okay, anybody else? Oi, aqui. É, do, é, como que você vê, é, do ponto de vista de licenciamento? He's coming. <laughs> <laughs> Do ponto de vista de licenciamento, como que você vê a aquisição da Sun pela Oracle? É, do ponto de vista de licenciamento, ou seja, o que, que pode acontecer com os produtos da Sun no seu ponto de vista? Okay. So, first of all, Sun has been very careful to always. Oops. Hi. <laughs> Sun has been very careful to always aggregate licenses our copyrights. That means that every time anybody donates anything to a Sun project, they have to also donate their copyright, or at least a license to use the copyright. So they've been very careful since the very beginning to always be able to defend their copyrights. But that's not why they're doing it. They're not doing it really to defend. They're doing it because it allows them to re-license under a proprietary license. So literally all of Sun's stuff is dual licensed effectively. The same way MySQL used to work, where the, the, most of the code is under GPL, but then they charge money to put special stuff in and they keep that proprietary because they own the copyrights. It's the same exact model. And most corporations have been using this for a long time. Richard Stallman is okay with it. Richard Stallman likes this model, okay? Now, there are some very famous public projects that do not have copyright aggregation. The Linux kernel is one. Mozilla is another one, where they, they didn't believe that people would give permission to, for copyright aggregation, so they never asked for it. Now, when Mozilla wanted to add LGPL, it took almost two years to achieve that because they had to get half of the copyright holders to agree in writing. Guess who the last company was to sign? That would be Sun. <laughs> so what I think is going to happen vis-a-vis -vis licensing, the great thing about open source is it can't ever be taken back. So everything that was open the day that Oracle took control is as open as it is. And if they try to close something, take back code that was already out there, we can nail them on that. That's not legal. But from today on, they can develop substantially new code under their proprietary license and not release it. And they have not shown a lot of understanding of open source. So I'm very concerned that they're going to head in that direction. We all are. We're very concerned. The reason that Monty Wadini has tried to hold up their acquisition was not so much MySQL. That was the presenting reason. But actually, as an open source activist, he is worried for all of those projects. And I'm worried too. I mean, some of the best work I did is at Sun, and it may not continue. I don't know if you guys read my blog, but I spent yesterday arguing with Oracle about blogs.sun.com and whether or not it should stay, whether that content should stay hosted, and whether or not it was, it was reasonable for, pe for them to stop allowing people to talk about their lives. So when we created blogs.sun.com, we wanted people to have an authentic voice talk about themselves and their enthusiasm for their work and for their lives. And it was really successful. But if you go look at Oracle's blogs, they're only about Oracle. And they're kind of marketeerish, right? And so I was arguing that voice choice. Now, Oracle has made its choice, and it's clear what they're going to do. They've already told everybody at Sun that's still at Snoracle, they've already told them, 
If you don't take your content down by the end of April, we may take it down for you if it has, if it has personal stuff in it. Do that on your own time, in your own place, but not on our, not on our dime. And see, the, this is going to be a cultural change for the people that are from Sun that's going to feel really crummy. So anyway, I was arguing for them because I love blogs at sun.com. It's one of the best things I ever did, right? And I'm arguing for open office, and I'm arguing for free Java as much as I can, everywhere I can. We're trying to get Harmony revitalized. And I think if, 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 our, if our plans for that go forward, it's going to be very surprising how that happens. So, so watch Harmony. But I'll tell you a story. If, you, if you've already heard this story, you guys can stop me. But you guys know about how the Mozilla Foundation happened? Do you know that story? So Mozilla was owned by Netscape. And Mitchell Baker, who was this, the general manager of the division that created Mozilla, when it got acquired by AOL, she was doing what she was supposed to do, which was teach AOL about open source. They had a bunch of changes that they wanted to push into the code base, and she refused to do it without vetting them to the community first. And they, did, they thought she was the problem. They didn't understand, so they fired her. They fired her. She was a vice president, so she had you know, enough resources to go home and work for free on the Mozilla project. And the great thing is that every single engineer deferred to her. Even though that she wasn't their boss anymore, she ran the project, you know? That's how it works. And eventually AOL went, okay, we get it. We can't stop this. Fuck us, you know, <laughs> right? We're gonna, we're gonna turn the lights off. We're gonna, we're gonna kill it. And she came to me and to some people at IBM and she said, they're gonna kill us. And we went to them and argued. We said, you cannot do this. You will be vilified by everyone in the world if you do this, because this is the only choice other than Microsoft. This is it. And we're suing Microsoft right now. So we're willing to put some money down to make sure this keeps happening. But you need to give their rights to a foundation. And you need to give them some money to let them create a foundation and continue the work that they're doing. Because they're not going to stop. And so they agreed to give some money and all the rights, and we gave some money, Sun gave some money, and IBM gave some money. And that gave them enough money to keep 10 engineers working for two years. And you know what they did, right? They wrote Firefox. Yay. <laughs> so that's a good story. Maybe that will happen to some of the projects that are at Sun or at Oracle now. But it's going to take all of us and our voice, our collective voice, telling them what we expect. So first we're waiting, we're taking a wait and see attitude. They keep telling us that they're good guys. But we are watching. And you guys all need to watch too. And if you start seeing problems, you need to write to opensource.org. Okay? Anything else? Hi. Yeah. Here. Um, you, you mentioned Steve Jobs. Uh, when he launched OS X, he said would be based on a open source foundation on open source uh, kernel. Right, Darwin. Darwin. We never heard about that again. <laughs> that's, right? called, that's called marketeerism. Yeah. So could you talk about that? Uh, what happened to Darwin? Is, is it still something imported at Apple uh, for the iPhone? Uh, so there's a guy named Ernie Prabhakar, Dr. Ernie Prabhakar, and his whole job is to babysit the Darwin project. It does exist, and there are people that contribute to it, but it's not a current snapshot of the operating system. They, they, they take a snapshot every so often and kind of toss it over the wall. It's not really open source development, but there are people who run Darwin instead of Mac OS X, and they, you know, so they sacrifice a lot of features, but they do, they run it. But it's more common right now for people to run Ubuntu on a Mac. You know, I'm a good friend of Mark Shuttleworth's, and I will tell you that he has a Mac at his house, right? A big Mac. It's really lovely. <laughs> One of those nice ones with a really big screen, right? And um, the reason he has it, he is absolutely com uh, committed to Linux and the Linux desktop. So he doesn't have it because he thinks it's better. He has it because he wants to be better than it. You might as well know your competition, right? Uh, and these days, Ubuntu is starting to get good enough that you don't need to use Mac OS X anymore. You know, I just, I'm starting a Wikimedia next week, and they just, I just put in my order for my computer from them, and it's going to be a Mac, but it's going to run Ubuntu, because it's that, it's that good now. 
right? So, um, you know, it's hard not to love the beauty of Mac hardware. It is beautiful. And uh, unfortunately, the market is rewarding Steve for being himself. I don't know what to say about that. They're getting more, I don't, you know about the tablet, right? And it's completely closed down. I mean, you're not even allowed to, you can't even develop apps for it. How sick is that, right? So, but the iPhone was like that too. And you know how that changed, right? The iPhone was not going to have an SDK. And then a bunch of us went to Adobe in San Francisco one afternoon and did a, a hackathon, right? iPhone dev camp, and we hacked it. And a lot of the people in that room were people who had worked for Apple for a long time and maybe worked on the Newton and were really frustrated with his choices, right? So they sat there and they hacked it and they cracked it and they figured out how to make it be a viable open platform. And it freaked Apple out and they had to deal. That's why there's an SDK. And so the yesterday or Wednesday, the tablet gets announced and I immediately get an invitation to iPad uh, dev camp, which is going to happen next weekend. <laughs> so, you know, that it's, it's, it's always the same. <laughs> anyway, I love Apple products. I'm an Apple fangirl. I worked for them for eight years. But it's hard. I mean, how, I, how I justify it myself is in terms of productivity. I look at Richard, who works, I know, I think you probably know, he has this very strange computer system that it allows him ultimate freedom, right? This is why Richard is who he is, because he's willing to sacrifice everything, including personal productivity, in order to live to his principles, and I admire that a lot. But I can't do my job at Wikipedia without being really productive, so I have to use tools that help with that. And Wikipedia is a web product. You know, he doesn't even ever go on the web. He literally never, ever launches a browser, Richard, because he's so pissed off that they're not having to give up their code. So, you know. Acho que a gente tem tempo para mais uma só. Just one more. Okay. I need to know, what are they saying? Hi. Uh, what do you think now that everything is going to the cloud and even Google come to Brazil to a Google Developers Day and Chris Bourne tell us that 80% uh, of what Google uses for his operation are open source. Yeah, are Amazon too. Amazon's the other big cloud people and they, do, they use it too. How do so you think that the, this new world for what, what we are going where the power is not more in the desktop or in the mobile, but it's in the cloud. Okay, so first of all, about clouds. It's not, a, it's not one big cloud. It's lots of little clouds. It's a, it, so you know history repeats itself, right? So very much the cloud thing is going to be very much like as many operating systems as there used to be until there's a consolidation. That's just how it works. New technologies, they all try to race to be the dominant one, and then one or two of them prevail and everybody else falls apart. And so we're going to see that, first of all. But part of why there's Summer of Code, you guys all like Summer of Code, right? Summer of Code is good, true? Part of why there is Summer of Code is because Google knows that they are not morally doing the right things with open source. I mean, legally they're doing the right thing, but they're getting a lot of benefit and they're not giving a lot back, right? They're, they're doing disruptive things like, like Android, but they're not, for instance, they took those class libraries from Harmony, but they don't donate to Harmony, right? But they do donate to the Apache Software Foundation. They donate money. And they do Google Summer of Code, which you know spreads a lot of open source goodness, right? So they're very clever about how they give back. Amazon as well is looking at projects, you know, programs for how to give back. They do a better job of putting changes back where they're supposed to be, right? But like, like Google, they're taking advantage of that distribution exception a little bit. So there are some open source clouds. There is work in the open source world on clouds. There is a lot of money going into projects like Hadoop, which is used pretty universally right now to do data manipulation in the cloud. Right? The bigger question is, what about that patent that Google just got for MapReduce? 
I mean, MapReduce was created a long time ago in computer science labs, and how is it that they can patent that, right? I mean, that's broken. I don't know what to say about that. But um, I think what we're going to see, and we always knew we would, it's a pendulum, right? We get really far in one paradigm, and then the pendulum switches back, and then we have to push it again. And it's, that's how it's going to be. Tim O'Reilly's been saying for at least five years now, OK, great, so we squeezed all the stupid money out of the software stack. But it's going to move somewhere else, and because there's a conservation of money. And where it's going to move to is data. Data is king. So it's not so much the cloud infrastructure to be worried about. It's the data. And watch who owns the data. Now, we started working at OSI on an da open data definition a while ago. I don't know if we're ever going to finish it or if somebody else is going to take up that work and finish it. But that's an important thing to look at, is rules for open data. What, how can you say you're an open data company? A lot of companies do. There was, while you guys were here, there was a thing about privacy going on in, in um, America, a big summit on web privacy. And I was watching the tweet stream from it. And they were noticing a lot of things. Like, for instance, Adobe Flash leaves all kinds of hidden cookies on your, on your um, browser when it plays a Flash movie that you can't, deal with, you can't do anything about. Right? It's a, when, you, when you purge your cookies, it doesn't clean those. So you have no privacy as regards the Flash that you play, which is you know, shame on Adobe. right? Um, but they were, in, in the tweet stream, they were saying that the people at Google that are working to make your data retrievable out of their system so that you can vote with your feet and take your stuff somewhere else if you don't like their policies, they're doing a good thing. Yahoo did this with Flickr, right? where you can take your pictures out of Flickr and they disappear. They do not persist, that you own that. But you do not own it in Facebook. Any picture you put in Facebook is potentially going to be there forever because of the way they've architected their privacy rules. If there's a picture of you and him together, and you post it, and you tag it to his name, a physical copy of that picture sits in his file. And even if you get rid of your whole account and take down everything, you cannot erase his copy. See, that's broken. That's not pri that doesn't respect people's ownership and privacy. And um, there's a lot of instances like that out there. Data is the new frontier. As much as we need to all keep working to participate and, and make everything that we're building better, we need to really watch that data issue. OK? Everybody happy? That was my last question. Thank you very much for listening. Pessoal, é, como vocês sabem, acho que talvez ela tenha falado.